there's a portrait of the composer Frédéric Chopin by his friend, the painter Eugène de la Croix, which hangs in the Louvre Museum in Paris. What most people don't realize is that this is actually part of what was originally a much larger canvas. In the original, the painting depicted Chopin seated at the piano with his lover, Georges Sand, at his side, knitting. The canvas was apparently left unfinished and was discovered in the artist's studio after his death. One of the subsequent owners decided to sever the canvas so that the painting of Georges Sand and that of Frédéric Chopin could be exhibited separately. Several commentators on the life of Chopin have observed that this severing of the canvas is a, an appropriate metaphor for a relationship which in real life uh, was not destined to succeed. Chopin's relationship with Georges Sand was an improbable one at best. Frédéric Chopin was born in Poland in 1810. He was a brilliant child prodigy, pianist, composer. He left his native country in 1829 and eventually settled in Paris in 1831, where he became something of a sensation for his piano playing, his composing, his ability to improvise at the keyboard. Apparently, he was introduced to the novelist Georges Sand uh, sometime in 1836, and we believe the introduction was furnished by the Countess Marie d'Agou, who was the romantic partner of another famous pianist composer, Franz Liszt. Apparently, Chopin's initial impressions of Georges Sand were not very favorable. He commented to a friend, is this really a woman? Georges Sand was the pen name of one of the most celebrated novelists of the early 19th century. She was married, but she had left her husband, uh, eventually gaining custody of her two children. Uh, she had a series of affairs, some with celebrated men, like the novelist Alfred Musset. Her pen name uh, came from the name of one of her lovers, Jules Sandeau, another novelist. And uh, she was, by all accounts, something of a prototypical feminist. She liked to dress in male attire. She smoked cigars. She had rather uh, heretical views of uh, religion. Uh, she was, you might say, a total secularist. Chopin, by contrast, came from a rather conservative background, traditionally Catholic. He wanted to be seen as aristocratic in his manner, in his bearing. Uh, and it's understandable that he was initially taken aback by Sand's brashness. Nevertheless, a relationship formed. We're not clear how romantic a relationship this was. There are uh, several references in the letters of Georges Sand to her frustration at not having much of a physical connection to Chopin, her pu being puzzled over a kind of restraint that he showed towards her. Uh, she had nicknames for him, Freak Freak and Cheap Cheap, which were puns on his name, Frédéric Chopin, but they're also kind of the sounds of a small, vulnerable bird. And in reality, Chopin himself was rather frail. He suffered from what in the 19th century was known as consumption, what we now know to have been tuberculosis. So he was extremely slender and delicate. Uh, later on in the relationship, Sand took to calling him Petit sans sex, or little sexless one. So it is hard to know exactly what went on between the two of them, but it was nevertheless a very close bond, and Chopin spent any number of summers in the uh, estate of Georges Sand's uh, family in the French countryside in uh, Noan. Sand and Chopin both wanted to leave Paris during the winter of 1838 into 1839. Uh, Chopin believed that the change uh, of climate to a warmer region of Europe would do his health good. Sand also had concerns for her son Maurice's health. Apparently he suffered from rheumatism. So on the recommendation of several friends, they decided to spend the winter on the Balearic island Mallorca off the coast of Spain. For the sake of discretion, they traveled separately. They met up in southern France and took the boat from Barcelona to the capital city of Mallorca, Palma. We know about their stay in Mallorca from several sources. Chopin carried on an active correspondence with friends back in Paris. He was uh, 
eagerly corresponding with several publishers. Uh, he had uh, already an advance from a publisher in Paris, Camille Playel, for a set of preludes for piano. And apparently he had started work on the collection, but he was counting on the time in Mallorca to finish it. So we have his correspondence. We also have a number of writings of Georges Sand. Uh, we have an extensive autobiography, which she entitled The Story of My Life. We also have a smaller volume, which she called Anivera Mallorca, or A Winter in Mallorca, where she recounts her experiences on the island with Chopin and her two children. According to the writings of Chopin, this day started pleasantly enough. Uh, he writes in November of 1838, they had already arrived, he writes from Palma de Mallorca to a close friend of his in Paris, Julian Fontana. My dear, I am in Palma, among palms, cedars, cacti, olives, pomegranates, everything the Paris Botanical Gardens have in their greenhouses. A sky like turquoise, a sea like lapis lazuli, mountains like emeralds, air like heaven, sun all day and hot, everyone in summer clothing, at night guitars and singing for hours, huge balconies with great vines overhead, Moorish walls, everything looks towards Africa, as the town does, in short, a glorious life. Go to Playel, this is a reference to his French publisher, the piano has not yet come. Playel was also a piano manufacturer who had promised to ship an upright piano to Chopin uh, in Mallorca for his work. Uh, how was it sent? You will soon receive some preludes. So Chopin alludes to the work that he hoped to complete on Mallorca. Several weeks later, though, in early December, he writes to the same uh, Julian Fontana, I can't send you the manuscript of my preludes yet because it's not finished. I have been as sick as a dog these last two weeks. I caught a cold, in spite of the fact that it's 18 degrees Celsius, roses, oranges, palms, figs, and three of the most famous doctors of the island. One sniffed at what I spat up, the second tapped where I spat it from, the third poked about and listened to how I spat it. One said I had died, the second that I'm dying, the third that I shall die. All of this, of course, has affected the preludes, and God knows when you will get them. I shall stay for a few days in the loveliest district in the world, sea, mountains, everything you want. I shall lodge in a huge old ruined monastery of Carthusians, whom many, uh, Mendizabal has expelled, as if specially for me. And I should elaborate that Mendizabal was an allusion to a prime minister of Spain at the time, who uh, gained notoriety for a project he referred to as a desamortización, which had to do with a confiscation of church property, a um, public rendering of uh, monastic property, which is what enabled Chopin and Georges Sand to uh, stay in what had been a monastery of the Carthusian order outside of Palma for most of their time on the island. And it's significant, given Chopin's own Catholicism and the uh, conservative nature of the island natives who tended to resent Chopin and Sand, saw them as a rather uh, exotic couple all the way from Paris, and were undoubtedly full of resentment for the fact that the monks had recently been expelled from this charter house, from this Carthusian monastery, apparently for the benefit of this uh, famous composer from abroad and his mistress. Chopin was still waiting for his piano. It wound up being held for um, duty payments in the port of Palma de Mallorca. And he was a composer who above all else needed the stimulation of a piano, the ability to improvise at the keyboard in order to compose. So it must have been a source of enormous frustration to him in addition to his failing health. Apparently, rainy season soon set in. The roads were nearly impassable on the island. There are letters from Chopin where he talks about how the dirt roads wash away with each rainstorm, so there's no clear-cut route to get from uh, the monastery where they were staying into the town. Uh, the carts uh, on which they traveled frequently had no springs, so poor, frail Chopin was uh, considerably jostled from whatever traveling he had to do. 
What he did take with him, even though he didn't have his piano, were a few volumes of music. It was the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, a composer who had lived more than 100 years before Chopin. Uh, it was specifically the two volumes of keyboard works Bach had named the Well-Tempered Clavier. They were each a set of 24 preludes and fugues. Why 24? One piece in each of the major and minor keys of tonal music. So Chopin, in setting work on his own set of 24 preludes, was paying a kind of homage to Bach, and that can be felt in the music he produced. What did Chopin absorb from the music of Bach? One thinks of Bach as the great master of polyphony, of writing music for many independent musical voices, for knowing how to combine different musical voices into a wonderfully coherent harmonic fabric. Certainly, in many of his preludes, Chopin shows that he was deeply immersed in studying the music of Bach. Uh, Bach was capable of suggesting harmony, was capable of suggesting a multitude of musical voices with a single line. He could write things like, where even though you're hearing only one note at a time, the suggestion is that there's a full harmonious texture being elaborated with many different voices. Chopin seems to have absorbed this, for example, in his 14th prelude in E-flat minor. He's basically writing one note in a time. The two hands are always in unison at the octave, but one can trace from the way the notes are placed, several different independent lines. One can emphasize the top. One can emphasize the bottom. interpreter is free to decide, but the music, even though it's only one note at a time, seems to suggest the possibility of many strands, many independent polyphonic voices. In the fifth prelude in D major, for example, the basic sketch of the musical material is something like this. Chopin breaks and fractures all of those voices into something like this. In other pieces, Chopin evidence is a kind of counterpoint that was uh, especially prevalent among 19th century composers keyboard music. It's a kind of polyphony that we refer to as heterophony, which means essentially that a melody is accompanied by another version of itself. So for example, the third prelude sounds initially like a kind of etude for the pianist's left hand. But on closer examination, one hears this melody. And if you slow down the busy notes of the accompaniment, one can hear the same pitches buried. And that idea of alternative versions of the same melody uh, superimposed upon itself was a, a special part of 19th century polyphony and is present in many of the preludes. <laughs> 
Georges Sand uh, formulated a rather negative impression of Mallorca and uh, of her visit there. She certainly was not able to be productive. She found herself cast more in the role of mother and caretaker to Chopin than lover. She wound up having to cook for him, nurse him in his frail health. Um, her own accounts of their stay in Mallorca are surprisingly negative. She refers to Chopin as our invalid, as if he were had been a burden to her. Uh, her accounts of the local people are rather racist and uh, intolerant. For example, writing about Shrove Tuesday processions, she says, one evening we were roused by a visitation which I shall never forget. It began with an unaccountable noise comparable only to that of thousands of walnut sacks rolling incessantly over the floor. We hurried out into the cloister to see what it could be. The cloister was empty and dark as usual, but the noise came nearer and nearer, and soon a faint light began to illuminate the immense steps of the vaults. Gradually it was revealed as the flame of several torches, and then, in the ruddy smoke which they emitted, appeared a battalion of beings hateful to God and men. They were no less than Lucifer himself, attended by his whole court, an archdevil all in black, horned with blood-red face, and around him a swarm of imps with bird's heads, horses' tails, and tawdry finery of every color. Also she-devils or shepherdesses dressed in white and pink, who looked as if they had been carried off by these unprepossessing devilkins. They were only village people, wealthy farmers and tradesmen, celebrating Shrove Tuesday. The strange noises attending their progress were made by wooden castanets, which several urchins, their faces covered by grimy, hideous masks, were all playing simultaneously, not in regular rhythmic phrases as in Spain, but in an unbroken rattle like drums beating a double flam. This noise, which also accompanies their dances, is so crude and harsh that it needs courage to support a quarter of an hour. In their festival processions, they break it off suddenly to sing a coplita in unison on a musical phrase that always repeats itself and seems to have no end. And then the castanets take up their rattle again for three or four minutes, splitting everyone's eardrums. There could be no more uncivilized way of celebrating a festival. But the musical phrase, though nothing in itself, takes on great character when thus sung at long intervals and by voices that have a peculiar quality of being veiled even when full-throated and dragging even when brisk. I believe that the Moors used to sing like this. So it is curious and, and perhaps a little disappointing to encounter uh, on Georges Sand's part what seems to be almost a sort of bigotry towards the local culture that she encounters on Mallorca. Uh, but she was a Parisian woman, she was a celebrity, and the indigenous population of Mallorca did not take kindly to her and her lover Chopin. By February of 1839, they uh, set out to return to France. Chopin was in extremely poor health. According to Georges Sand, he was spitting up blood by the bowlful during the return uh, to the mainland. Um, he was eventually nursed back to health over a period of several months in the south of France. Nevertheless, he did complete work on his preludes, and he was able to send them off to his publishers early in 1839 from Mallorca. The word prelude conveys a sense of introduction. One might ask, what are they preludes to? In the case of Bach and the Well-Tempered Clavier, it's clear each prelude is a kind of introduction to a fugue. And there was a tradition that dates back to the time of Bach and before of writing short improvisational-like pieces to introduce more serious, formerly uh, structured works. Uh, in this case, however, Chopin writes only preludes, and he is trying to give a sense of improvisational freedom and spontaneity, even though obviously the pieces are written down. What makes the preludes sound improvisational? For one thing, they're very short. Many of them last under a minute. The longest of them perhaps lasts five or six minutes. 
More importantly than their actual duration, they usually present only a single musical idea. They develop generally only a single theme. Uh, so many of them sound like the beginnings of pieces and nothing more. Uh, some of them use some of the improvisational tropes that date back to the time of Bach. For example, Bach in the first prelude of his well-tempered clavier begins this way. And what Bach is really doing is taking a chordal progression and breaking it up, arpeggiating it, something pianists typically do when they improvise, when they're warming up, when they're noodling. Chopin begins his own set of preludes. essentially just based on these chords. Broken up in, in his own way. Many of the Chopin's preludes end in ways that seem inconclusive, as if more is to follow. For example, we usually expect a piece to end with what we call a perfect cadence, uh, and a formula, a harmonic formula that uh, involves bringing the piece back to the key in which it began with the main note sounding both in the bass and in the melody. So if you're in the key of C, where C would be present in both outer voices. Chopin's prelude in C, for example, though, ends this way. Not with the C in the melody, but with the third note of the scale, what we would call an imperfect cadence. His G major prelude ends the same way with the third note of the scale in the melody, giving you a sense of inconclusiveness. Um, the 23rd prelude in F major, even more strikingly, ends this way. With this un unresolved seventh just hanging out there. The second prelude presents a very curious case of a piece not so much being in a particular key, but rather moving towards a key, in this case, the key of A minor. For example, the second prelude begins actually in the key of E minor. And its first phrase ends with a very weak cadence in G major, even though it's a G major somewhat beclouded by references to G minor. Then the music moves on to B minor. Only now do we realize what key we're headed for. 
drags out the cadence, stuck on the dominant of A minor. The dominant seventh, and only at the very end, giving us the destination of the piece, the A minor chord. And this kind of very strange tonal organization where a piece doesn't begin by stating the key it's in, but only gradually advances towards it, might be a reference to the tradition of improvising preludes to larger compositions where the pianist would want to arrive only at the end of the improvisation, at the actual key of the piece to follow. So Chopin was alluding to a tradition of improvisation. Uh, there was even a verb in French, préluder, to make preludes. And it was assumed that a pianist would sit down to play a larger piece and would warm up first, would improvise, would noodle around, would test the instrument, would prepare himself and prepare the public for the larger work to follow. So by ending these short little preludes in these inconclusive ways, Chopin was alluding to this tradition. There is a question whether the 24 preludes were conceived as simply a collection of 24 pieces that pianists could use to introduce other works, or whether they were intended to be experienced as a unified cycle, where we could say each prelude introduces the next prelude. On the basis of historical evidence, we'd have to conclude that they were a collection of pieces. Chopin himself never performed all 24. Uh, in public in his own lifetime. Uh, there are concerts in which he used individual preludes to introduce other works of his. So he certainly seemed comfortable dipping into the collection uh, in the way I described before. There are other reasons, though, to believe that the 24 preludes gain from being performed back to back. And there is certainly a case to be made for the 24 preludes as a complete cohesive cycle. For one thing, many of the preludes end by leaving us with a note that will be picked up at the beginning of the next. So for example, the ending of the first prelude. Then the second prelude begins. With the same E in the melody. Or the third prelude with that B in the melody, which becomes the starting pitch of the fourth prelude. Uh, other reasons to think of the 24 preludes as being interconnected have to do with subtle recall over the course of the cycle. For example, in the eighth prelude in F sharp minor, Chopin writes, and the swirling decorative notes can be heard in a slower inverted version. In the accompaniment of the 13th prelude in F sharp major, or in still another inverted form in the middle of the 21st prelude in B flat major. Or, for example, the ninth prelude, which is in the key of E, moves at one point to the key of A flat major. And then the A flat major prelude, the 17th in the cycle, moves to the key of E major in one of its episodes. So the ninth prelude. back to E major. Here, in the A flat major prelude, <laughs> 
and moves to the key of E major. So there is this sense of these kind of complementary relationships over the course of all 24 preludes. Another trait that seems to unite the 24 preludes is a certain melodic motif present in many of them. Many of the uh, opening melodies of the preludes use the fifth and sixth notes of whatever scale the prelude is in. So for example, the opening prelude in C major the melody starts with the fifth note of the C major scale alternating with the sixth note. The fourth prelude in E minor features a rocking back and forth between the fifth and sixth notes of that scale. The fifth prelude in D major begins with a rocking back and forth between the major and minor forms of the fifth or the sixth and fifth scale notes. The cycle as a whole ends with a very dramatic plummet into the bass, which features the sixth scale note to the fifth in the key of D minor, the key of the final prelude. So in so many of these melodies are a similar kind of motific idea. George Sand writes about Chopin and the composition of his preludes on Mallorca in her autobiography, a work she completed several years after Chopin's death and long after the relationship had ended. But she writes that on Mallorca, he composed the most beautiful of these brief pages that he modestly entitled Preludes. They are masterpieces. Several bring to mind the visions of dead monks and echoes of funeral chants which besieged him. Others are melancholy and sweet. These came to him during the hours of sunlight and health, to the noise of the children's laughter beneath the window, the distant sound of guitars, the song of birds under the wet foliage, the sight of little pale roses blooming in the snow. Still others are mournful and sad, charming your ear, breaking your heart. There is one that came to him on a gloomy, rainy evening, which makes the soul frightfully despondent. His anxiety had been severe, to be sure, but it had frozen into calm despair. He was playing a marvelous prelude while weeping. On seeing us come in, he rose, uttered a loud cry, then said with a wild expression and in a strange tone of voice, Ah, just as I imagined, you have died. He had seen all that in a dream, and, no longer able to distinguish dream from reality, he had calmed himself and played the piano drowsily, persuaded that he had died himself. He saw himself drowned in a lake, heavy, icy drops falling rhythmically on his chest. And when I had him listen to the drops of water falling rhythmically on the roof, he denied having heard them. He was even angry at what I translated by the expression imitative harmony. He vehemently protested, and he was right, against the naivete of believing his notes to have been oral imitations. His genius, full of the mysterious harmonies of nature, translated them into sublime equivalents in his music, and not by a servile imitation of sounds. His composition that evening was certainly full of raindrops resonating on the tiles of the monastery, but they were perhaps translated in his imagination and in his music into tears falling from heaven onto his heart. And most commentators take Sand's description of this particular prelude to refer to one known as the raindrop prelude. It's a nickname that was given to this prelude by later commentators on the basis of Sand's description. Most people take it to refer to the 15th prelude in D flat major, which goes something like this. And presumably, the raindrops are the repeated 
note that persists throughout the entire prelude, even into... a gloomy-sounding, contrasting section. Uh, there are other commentators, though, who speculate it could be the sixth prelude in B minor that she was referring to. A work full of throbbing, repeated notes in the accompaniment as well. The reality is, it was not a nickname conferred by Chopin. As Sand herself writes, Chopin did not like the idea of his music having specific programmatic associations. Uh, but the point is, the preludes are full of pieces with throbbing, repeated notes uh, of sometimes a deeply tragic, obsessive character. Perhaps most significantly, though, is the question of what these 24 pieces heard back to back uh, add up to emotionally. How do they register on the listener? Uh, for one thing, the succession of different keys, pieces some of which are slow, some of which are fast, some of which are flashy and brilliant, uh, others of which are more introspective, certainly makes for a satisfying sense of variety. If the cycle has an overall emotional impact, it tends to be a very disturbing one, a, a, a deeply tragic, unsettling one. Um, the pianist Alfred Brendel once said about the composer Schubert that everything Schubert writes in a major key is like a mirage or a dream, and everything that he writes in a minor key seems to represent the, the cruelty of reality. I would say much the same thing about Chopin in his 24 preludes. One frequently has the sense that the preludes in a major key are like dreams, like happy memories, but the ones in the minor key really describe the reality of, of suffering and, and the harshness of life. Musicians in modern times tend to divide things into categories. We tend to think of some musicians being composers, other musicians being interpreters. We think of some kinds of music as requiring improvisation, like jazz, and other kinds of music uh, involving strict adherence to a written text, namely classical music. In the time of Chopin, though, these distinctions were not so absolute. It was understood that if you were trained as a pianist, you were being trained in the art of improvisation. You were supposed to be able to at least compose to some modest extent. And Chopin in his preludes is very much reminding us of this tradition of improvisation and reminding us that the line between composing and improvising was not always so clearly fixed. The preludes began as improvisations. Georges Sand tells us about hearing Chopin invent these pieces uh, as, he, as he experimented at the piano, and then go through an arduous process of writing them down and refining them. Chopin was a shrewd businessman. In the early 19th century, there was no concept of international copyright. So a composer like Chopin, if he wanted to protect his rights, would have to have his music published separately in different countries. So Chopin made sure that he dealt with publishers in Paris, in German-speaking countries, in London, and he would often have to copy out by hand uh, versions to send each of these publishers. And it seemed that even when he was copying out pieces, sometimes on the same day, he couldn't stop creating, he couldn't stop changing, he couldn't stop trying to tinker with what he had done. So that improvising and fixing through notation his creativity were not mutually exclusive. And in the preludes, we have a, the phenomenon of music that is written in order to give the impression of not being written, in order to give the impression of being improvised and spontaneous. And the challenge to interpreters is to 
recall this sense of uh, improvisation, of invention, even though the music is so rich in detail and so full of subtle connections, some of which perhaps were unconscious on Chopin's part and other of which uh, perhaps he, he labored over, even though he concealed those efforts to posterity.